to just sort of be able to go on a date and be like, I don't know. You know, it'll either go or it won't. You don't have to be like this person. I'm either going. I feel like before I discovered non-monogamy, dates were like either do I see this person as someone I'm spending the rest of my life with or do I never want to see them again? <laughs> That's kind of how dating works. And now it's like, I'll see this person until I don't feel like it anymore or they don't feel like it anymore. It's it's so much more freeing and so much, um, I just feel more relaxed. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 197. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a kick-ass interview with Emily. She is non-monogamous and kinky, and she's also the creator of Welcome to Kinkyville. It's an amazing conversation, and we're so excited to share it with you. Yeah, Emily talks through a lot of her own experiences in discovering and exploring non-monogamy and why it works for her, and also a lot of the motivation behind her creating and coming up with the idea for Welcome to Kinkyville. And if you're not sure what Welcome to Kinkyville is, it is a animated TV series about kink education and how to do kink right. We're super excited about it. The uh, One of the producers or the producer, uh, Gabriel, reached out to us back in August about coming on the show to promote their Kickstarter. And their Kickstarter is wrapping up next week on September 9th. Yes, they're pretty close to reaching their goal, so we would really encourage you to go check it out and support them if you can. Yeah, we're not being paid or anything to promote this. It's just we saw the trailer when they reached out. Uh, The trailer is available on the Kickstarter page. It's awesome. We're super excited about this. I think once you listen to this interview with Emily, you will be equally excited. And if you want, go back and listen to episode 193 with Sonia and Gabriel. Uh, They talk about it quite a bit as well because Gabriel's on the project and... Gabriel is one of Emily's former partners, so he comes up in this episode as well, and we thought it would be good to have some context around that. Yes. So if you want to support Welcome to Kinkyville, if you want to get in on it, uh, help make this thing a reality, uh, we would love that. Uh, head over to welcometokinkyville.com or just go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the show notes for today's episode or down in the podcast player for today's episode. And there will be links there to where you can go uh, make a pledge, donate, um, and support this project. We're super excited about it. We pledged. We're super thrilled. And go, we go can't, check it out. We can't wait to hopefully see this thing come to reality. Before we jump into Emily's interview, we do have a couple of announcements. The first up, a huge, huge thank you to our entire Patreon community. As we always say, we're so thankful for each and every one of you. If you are looking for community, we would strongly encourage you to go check it out. Uh, Go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and just click on the Patreon tab. All of the details are there. We're going to just quickly mention a few dates for September um, so that you have these. The men's group call is September 8th. The women's group call is September 14th. And the monthly Q&A is September 15th. Again, all that information is on our website, on the Patreon tab, or you can go directly to Patreon as well. Yeah, as Emma said, a huge thank you to everyone who is a part of that community. Thank you for making it amazing. We appreciate all of you. Yes. The other thing we're super excited about are that our meet and greets are back, and the next virtual meet and greet is going to be on September 22nd from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. That's a Wednesday. And if you haven't joined a virtual meet and greet before, they're so much fun, and they give you an opportunity to meet people from all kinds of different backgrounds from around the world. So we'd love to have you come join us. Just go to our website and click on the community tab, and you can go down and click on virtual meet and greet. Yeah, and if you are maybe a little tired of Zoom, Yes. And you want to get back out and meet people in real life? Yes. <laughs> we are finally, I mean, yes. <laughs> we are finally bringing back some of our in person meet and greets. We did a few of these back in late 2019, and we are going to be doing some more uh, this fall. So these are all going to be outdoors, and we're requiring vaccines. So we're going to do our damnedest to make sure that they are as safe as possible. And we are also monitoring 
COVID numbers and making sure that if things get too crazy, we're just going to cancel whatever event it is and everybody will get their money back. Yes. So that was important for us to get out of the way up front. Mm -hmm. Our first one is in Ann Arbor, Michigan on September 28th. Uh, that is a Tuesday and it is from 6 to 9 p.m. And it is it is at a park. We've rented a big picnic pavilion. We've gotten a liquor permit. So it's going to be a, a lot of fun. We're super excited about it. The next one is going to be in Atlanta on October 13th. It is going to be at a brewery in near the old fourth ward. Uh, I don't know exactly what that means other than Google Maps told me that, but I figure if you're from Atlanta, you know what I'm talking about. Hopefully. Hopefully. If not, go to Google Maps, look it up. <laughs> it's near there, very near there, and it will be from 7 to 9 p.m. on Wednesday, October 13th again. Um, all of the details on how to sign up for those is on our website. Click on the Community Events tab. And there will be another tab under there for in-person meet and greets. And we talk about how we're handling COVID. And once you sign up, you will get all of the information for the, ac the exact locations. Yes. The last one we're doing is October 27th in Tampa. We don't have all the details for that one yet because we haven't found a location because we can't find a location. So if you, if we're you, working on it. If you live in Tampa or near Tampa and you know of an awesome place, please send us an email. We would love that. Otherwise, we're just going to randomly pick something and hope it's awesome. Yes. Before we jump into the show, we do have one more announcement. And that is, you know, if you've been, a, I guess, a listener for a little while, you may remember back in January, we published a series called Power of Witness. And we did that with a collaboration with Catherine. And it was a group coaching series. And we wanted to quickly announce that she is doing another cohort of her Power of Witness coaching that will not be on the podcast. But if you want to join Go to the show notes for this episode and click on the links for Power of Witness or under resources, you can just go directly to the Power of Witness series on our website. And if you use those links, you can get $20 off by and join her upcoming cohort that's going to start September 30th. So again, all of that information, just go and find the Power of Witness um, links on our website. Yeah. And I would just say that was an awesome experience for us and we highly encourage it as well. So definitely check that out. I think that's all of the announcements. Thank you to everybody for listening to all these. We, I know we have a lot going on. Uh, one of the things that we're really focusing on with this show, as you can probably tell, is community and community building. And that involves us having a lot of shit going on. So thank you for listening. And also, if you want to learn more about anything we've talked about, again, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. And there is all of the information there, as well as how to contact us if you want to come on the show, if you want to give us feedback, if you want to send us a voicemail, any of that, we would love to hear from you. You can also see podcast show notes for every episode, including all of the resources we talk about, plus pictures from our of our guests and more. Yes. And more. And more and more and more. Now, anyway, let's go talk to Emily. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the show, Emily. We're excited to have you here. We're excited to talk about your work and everything about you. We don't know hardly anything about you. Just a little bit. Just enough to be intrigued. So welcome. Thank you. I'm going to go from complete mystery to completely nothing you don't know about me in about an hour. Yeah. Awesome. Zero to best friend in an hour. That's how we, That should <laughs> be the punchline of our show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, do you want to introduce yourselves so we can start building this friendship? Sure. I am Emily Blake. I am a, uh, I am a script supervisor. Uh, that's my job. And over the past month, that has been my life. Um, I, which means I work on film sets and I do a lot of things that people don't know exist. And basically anytime you ask me what my job is, I tell them Wikipedia because I do like 8,000 things. It's really hard to explain my job, but I sit next to the director and I take notes and I look for continuity. And if you ever seen a movie where there's like a, a movie within a movie and there's always some lady sitting next to the director with a binder and a stopwatch. That's me. Uh, so I live in Hollywood. I, um, technically live in North Hollywood. I, uh, I write, that's why I came out here to be a screenwriter. Um, and that has gone all kinds of different directions. I do cosplay. I design geek clothing. I, uh, craft everything. Um, and I like doing stuff. I have a dog who we, who we might hear from at some point. Yeah. Yeah, right now he's really getting, he's having a good time with a giant bully stick, which is of course a bull penis. So he's having just a blast. <laughs> hey, Perfect. Who hasn't had fun with one of those? Yeah. yeah. I mean, not me personally. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And, uh, we're again, we're excited. So 
non-monogamy. Um, well, you're first of all, you're working on a series yes. uh, called Welcome to Kinkyville, which is not necessarily non-monogamy specific, but we have some foresight to the fact that you have explored non-monogamy. And oh, so we'd sure, love yeah. we'd love to hear about how you got into that, when you got into that, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Well, the formative everything was my divorce. Um, uh, well, actually, if you go back even further, let's go back when I was born. Um, <laughs> so, perfect. Uh, perfect. My, uh, well, my, <laughs> um, but no, I, I, my, oof, I would say like my mother's a narcissist that informs a lot. Um, and so I married, I married the man. I did all the things she wanted me to do. I got the job she wanted me to do. I, I married the man she wanted me to marry. And he turned out to be kind of problematic. And, uh, so I was really, really unhappy in my marriage. Um, but I spent a lot of time, I was the golden child. So I spent a lot of time trying to live up to what she wanted me to do. And I wasn't true to who I was, um, and what I wanted. And then when I got divorced, finally, I was like, Oh, I, well, she didn't want me to get divorced. My parents didn't want it and they were rough on me. And so we didn't speak for like four years. So during that time I realized, Hey, I don't have a husband telling me what to do. I don't have a mom telling me what to do. Oh, who am I? And, um, and I met someone, I, well, a friend of mine and I were talking about what we like to do in the bedroom. And one of the things that I said was like, I think I'm really lazy. I just like to be told what to do. I don't really want to, you know, make decisions. And he was just like, Oh, it's okay to be a submissive. And I was like, so, oh, what now? <laughs> and then I started Googling and I was like, Oh, look at these people. Oh, they're so weird into this stuff. I want to research more of it just out of curiosity and not anything else. And before I knew it, that was what I was into. So I went, I went on to fat life still like, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. And then Gabriel is one of the, you know, when you go on fat life and you're a new submissive, you get barraged with 8 million emails and uh, Gabriel contacted me and he was the only person who did, who wasn't like super creepy. Uh, and I met him and then, it turns out he was married and I was kind of like, okay, for that it never occurred to me before, but it also didn't bother me like for a second. I was like, Hmm, all right. And then it sort of started to make sense. I mean, I think I've always been non-monogamous. I just didn't realize it. You know, even in the past, I've never been particularly jealous. I always thought it just made sense to just date who you wanted to date, but I didn't think I was allowed to until I met Gabriel. And it was like, cool. Especially since for me, my work schedule is bananas. I am, I will work 12 hour days, sometimes 15 hour days for weeks straight and then nothing. I will have no jobs for like three weeks and just do whatever. So it's like, I just had to cancel for the last job I did. I just had to cancel like five events because we were working weekends. And when I work a day, I can't do anything with work. So it, it's very difficult to be in a relationship with me because my schedule is so crazy. So non-monogamy in that respect really worked out being the non-married partner was great because he had his wife, he had his life at home already set up. And then I could just pop in and help when I have time. And I don't have to worry about my partner feeling abandoned because I can't spend time with them because that's somebody else to spend time with. So that's, that was sort of the trajectory of that, of how I, I got into it. And even though Gabriel and I aren't together anymore, I'm still pretty, that's still how I feel like living my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and through that, had you, like you started it and I, and the fat life side of things, did you then also start exploring like, you know, additional partners outside of Gabriel and outside of fat life to also fulfill, fulfill like other needs? Yeah. Less, less, I really hadn't had a serious relationship. I had a boyfriend for, right in the beginning for a little while. And then that he, he met someone who was monogamous and she was like, Oh, it's totally fine that you're dating this other person until he said he loved her. And then she was like, it's not okay anymore. You have to dump her. And he did. Um, so that was my first experience of having two relationships. So I was real sad about that. And then other than that, I mostly just casually dated. I hadn't really had a serious relationship partly due to my schedule. But I still like sort of believe for me, it's more important that I'm allowed to than that I actually do it because I like to flirt with other people. And if I feel like going on a date, I don't want to feel like, oh, I'm not allowed to find that person attractive, you know, which is how I used to feel when I was monogamous. It was like, oh, I can't look at that person. Oh, my fantasies are wrong, you know, and now it's like, no, it's fine. You're fine, you know, and I have a I have a partner who's relatively new and there was like a, a two a month and a half overlap. 
where I was like, I finally have two boyfriends. And then we bring up and I broke up. So I'm back to one boyfriend now. Um, <laughs> but, I, saw, uh, I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't laugh no, at what, that, that you broke up, but the way you put that all. Yeah. I was <laughs> I had, like bucket list, two boyfriends. Oh, <laughs> um, but my new partner is really great. And, uh, and you know, and he's been, he's also sort of new to exploring non-monogamy. And the other day he was like, I think, I think I might want to go out on a date with this person. And I was like, go for it. And he was just like, Oh, you know, so that's, that's more how I do it. I just sort of go with the flow. I don't really have any particular agenda right now. Like I said, I have one partner. If I meet somebody else, cool. If I don't, I'm all right with that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess going back to the beginning of like learning about non-monogamy, how did those first like steps go? If like you met Gabriel, you learned about, you were learning, it sounds like you were learning about more BDSM and different, um, that whole scene and, and also non-monogamy kind of around the same time. Mm -hmm. How, how did that time go for you? Like what, um, did you run into any challenges and what did that look like? Yeah, it was <laughs> getting a divorce and losing my parents and then discovering all these new things about myself. Plus that's when I started my career as a script supervisor all at the same time. Oh I am gosh. like a whole other person. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I had a huge awakening and it was all connected to the same thing of the ability, d the moment when I was like, Oh, I can make my own choices. I think that's one of the things that attracted me to BSM is that I was not used to being able to make my own choices. So it suddenly became like paralyzed by little decisions. Like I would go to a store and be like, two shirts. I want to buy one. I don't know which one to get. And I would stand there for like 15 minutes going, I don't know which shirt to pick. So I, I would text Gabriel and be like, which shirt? And he would tell me. And I was like, yes. Um, and that was great. But, uh, he also, uh, recommended reading the ethical slut. So I did, you know, I did, I like homework. So I was just like, yes, an assignment. I can research. I love research. So I was just like, read, 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 learn as much as I can join all the polyamory groups on Facebook. Um, and, and so I just devoured all of the information as fast as I could so I could learn. Um, there were challenges in that, like, because he was married, I didn't know what happens if she suddenly decides that she doesn't want you seeing me anymore. And it took a while to realize that Sonia's not like that, you know? Um, but there were some insecurities in the beginning about that. There was, and when I met them, they were not open about it. Uh, Gabriel was not allowed, I wasn't allowed to, to tag him in Facebook posts and pictures and stuff because Sonia's family didn't know that was the primary reason, but also he wasn't fully out. Um, and that was hard in the beginning. Cause I'm not a fan of that. I don't like being kept a secret and I was kind of a secret for a bit. Um, but gradually over time they opened up more and more and now they're, they're fully out there. I think I would like to pat myself on the back and think I took, I had a part in that. Cause I was sort of just like, I don't like being a secret. Please tell people about me. The, but the best example of when I knew it was the really positive moment was when, um, we went to an event that was this movie screening and it was a lot of Sonia's coworkers were going to be there. So by the way, Sonia is Gabriel's wife in case anybody didn't listen to that episode. Um, uh, Sonia's coworkers were there and, uh, she brought her boyfriend. So we thought, okay, we're all open at this thing. And Gabriel and I walked up holding hands. Um, and when I'm with him, I'm, I wear skirts and makeup and like look cute as hell. And that's part of the gig, you know, of being his sub. And so we're walking up, he's walking up with this like slightly slutty looking little, you know, uh, I, I almost call myself a little girl. I am a grown woman. Um, <laughs> I'm not an age player. Uh, but, um, we walked up and, uh, immediately she was like, well, you can't, you can't hold hands because some of my coworkers are here. And her boyfriend was not was just there as a friend. She wasn't, mm -hmm. she was not willing to say he was her boyfriend. And then she told one of our friends that I was a friend of them and we weren't allowed to hold hands. We weren't allowed to, you know, act like we were a couple. And I was still relatively new to all of this. So I was kind of quietly sad because <laughs> I really didn't like that. And we walked into the movie and I set my stuff down and they sat so Gabriel sat next, I was on the outside. Gabriel sat next to me. Sonia sat next to him and her boyfriend sat next to her. And she, she reached over and grabbed Gabriel's hand and they were holding it and, and she was holding it. And I was like, Oh my God, this is awful. I was so miserable. And then I got up to go to the bathroom. And when I came back, he said, grab your purse. We're leaving. 
And that was a great moment for me because he was like, I'm not doing that to you. I'm not putting you in that situation. And from that point on, it started to become, and no, no, no blame on Sonia. I think there was a submissive communication about what that was going to be. It's not like she intentionally did that. I think she thought we knew that we weren't supposed to be out at that event and he didn't realize that. And so, um, I don't think either of them did anything wrong, but it was a bad situation and he made it right by just being like, no, we're, we're leaving. And then that was, that was the moment when they started to open up a little bit more and realize that that's not fair to their partners to keep us a secret. So that was probably the biggest challenge. And once we got past that, it was kind of, it was kind of easy. I never really, again, cause my schedule is so weird. I never felt like I was missing a whole lot because I don't have a lot of time. So, you know, we still did a lot of fun stuff, you know, so it was a pretty good experience overall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really hard. Like, you know, to, to their credit, right? Like if, if they were still fairly new to this and had never really done it and you like, you don't know how to navigate these situations. It's not like there's a class in school where it's like, well, when you take your girlfriend and your wife and her boyfriend to a movie, like, and her coworkers are there, this is how you act. And like, so it's just, it's a constant negotiation and, and you never know how you're going, like, you don't know how you're going to respond. Sonia doesn't know how she's going to respond. Like nobody knows until you're in that moment. And that's, it's just really hard. So I think like, yeah, I just, I know it's, that's just, I don't know, wanting to acknowledge that that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. And it seems so easy. Like, well, we just went to a movie and it's like, yeah, but there's like so many layers of like, shame and being afraid and all sorts of things. And you're just trying to like live your best life and be out there. And you're not worried about her coworkers because it's not your coworker. Like it's just, yeah. It all goes back to societal norms. Right. And like what's expected, quote unquote, expected of us and how, how to handle those situations. And, and 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 walking up with me, holding my hand, looking like I did, there was definitely one of her coworkers definitely gave me like the dirtiest cold shoulder because she thought like, I mean, what, first of all, if you're hiding a side piece, why would you walk up to where your wife is holding hands with that person? But there was definitely a lot of judgment coming off that lady. So that didn't help matters, you know, no, for sure. right. For right. sure. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think it's important too, to hear like that perspective of the, I don't want to say the other woman, but like the, the partner who like we hear from like a lot of couples. And I think sometimes it's, it's easy to forget, not that we ever should, but that like, other people have feelings. Right. And so like even something as little as like holding a hand or not holding a hand can make a big difference. And, and I think that's true too, even like if it's a couple with another couple or a couple with whoever, like that sort of that couple privilege sometimes makes you blind to what's kind of going on around you. And so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, how have you seen, I guess yourself, I, well, it sounds like a lot of different ways, but I'm curious what you would say. How would you, how have you seen yourself grow over the relationship the last few years um, and exploring not monogamy? Um, God, it's, it's so freeing uh, to just sort of be able to go on a date and be like, I don't know. You know, it'll either go or it won't. You don't have to be like this person. I'm either going, I feel like before I discovered non monogamy, dates were like either, do I see this person as someone I'm spending the rest of my life with, or do I never want to see them again? (laughs) That's kind of how dating works. And now it's like, I'll see this person until I don't feel like it anymore, or they don't feel like it anymore. It's, it's so much more freeing and so much, um, I just feel more relaxed. And I think, you know, as far as like, even like I said, in the beginning, I was kind of paralyzed by decision-making. And I think partly due to the BDSM, partly non monogamy partly a lot of things, partly my own personal growth is now I don't feel that way as much anymore. That I, and that's partly one of the reasons our relationship ended is that I no longer needed someone to be my dom outside the bedroom anymore. And I think that that sort of had a change in our relationship. And I didn't really realize it until I was processing our breakup. You know, I don't think I acknowledged it at the time. So we never had a discussion about where, where we are now. We just kind of went, what's happening? But, uh, I think that, that it really, a lot of it really helped me mentally sort of get back on my own two feet after trauma and uh sort of live my life the way i want to live it and not have to worry about rules um oh, everyone else's rules and now i preach it everywhere i go i'm like you know like i'll be in groups you know people who are vanilla and and, and monogamous groups on facebook and someone will ask for relationship advice and they'll be like i don't know my boyfriend seems to be think this other girl is really cute and oh god he's probably cheating on me it's the end of the world we should break up and people will be like yeah dump him and it's like okay hold hold on hold on 
okay. And then there's a lot, I, I like preach constantly everywhere I go, like, stop living your relationships based on rules someone else set for you. Is this actually, are you actually concerned this person is cheating on you or are you just concerned that it looks bad? You know, so that's a, that's sort of who I've become now is the constant. I used to be a school teacher, so I think there's still some of that left in me, but I'm constantly like preaching to people about, you know, relationships don't have to be whatever society tells you they are. They can do whatever you want them to be. Right. Sure. Yeah, they can be. And I think that's part of writing your own script and writing your own life. But like that's so many people out there don't know that that's uh, an option. So th- there it is. I, I feel like I spent so many years trying to be the person that my mother wanted me to be or trying to be the person society was telling me to be without realizing that I don't have to. And so now I'm in, in all the shame, all these fantasies I had in my head that I just buried deep down because they're not normal. They're not okay. Um, and now it's like, it's totally okay. I'm my authentic self. I'm mad. I spent so many years not living that. And I want other people to realize that it's totally okay. No, nothing makes me, I know this is more kink than non-monogamy, but I always talk about non too. I just did that the other day with a friend, um, that it makes me really happy that when I start talking to people about this, because I'm so open about it, they kind of go, Oh, I, okay. Okay. I can talk about this. You're not going to judge me. And they're, they've constantly been like, this is so nice to have this conversation that, that this is okay. And I'm like, yeah, it is okay. And that brings me so much joy when they feel like I'm a safe space to talk about it because that that's, I wish someone had been there for me to tell me that it was okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For sure. And I think too, you kind of touched on this, like the, you know, when you would date before as a monogamous minded person, that it was either like, I have to like grow old and die with this person or I need to kick them out like after the first date. Otherwise you're just wasting time. Yeah. There's time wasting is a big obsession in monogamy, I think. Right. Right. For sure. And so like how, like, and you said kind of like you, you kind of had the two boyfriend overlap for like a couple of months, but have you felt, I guess you have kind of said that like you felt a lot, you feel a lot more free to, just let a relationship be what it is, whether it's one date, 10 dates, or you move in together. Like there's not really the relationship, the relationship escalator anymore. Yeah. Guys, it's, it's, I mean, I live, I live alone. I like living alone despite being an extreme extrovert. I also like living alone a lot. Um, and I, I don't know if I'll ever get married again. I mean, after my divorce, I would have said, absolutely not. I'll never live with anybody again. I had a roommate for a little while. I was my best friend, but other than that, like, I'm never going to live with a romantic person again, which is, again, why the relationship with great Gabriel was so great, because he never expect that of me. But I, I'm starting to think maybe I'll consider it uh, again, but uh, I don't need it. I don't feel like I have to. I don't want kids. I'm a little past the age of having kids anyway. Um, I don't I don't feel pressured to do any of those things. I could just be who I want to be, spend time with who I want to spend it with, and, you know, live my life, which I really, really like. Yeah. Yeah. Have you continued to explore down the the kink and fat life route or like once you kind of, you said like you kind of healed from that trauma, you didn't need like the day to day Dom sub, but is it, is it still something that you explore? Like, Oh yeah. I, I don't really go on kink life much anymore. Or fat, kink life, fat life much anymore because, um, it's the same reason I don't go to munches. It's, it's, it's really, there's always some real creepy people who just kind of, it's just exhausting to deal with them. And I've just had so many negative experiences. I, I love Fet Life for the resource that it is, but I just kind of got tired of the constant barrage of messages and grossness. Um, but uh, I still explore kink quite a bit on my own um, and in like Facebook groups, which is a little bit safer space. And I really want to go, I've, I've done a couple of like a few classes at various dungeons. Um, and I really want to go to some more dungeon parties, that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I still love, I love impact play. I'm like, that's my favorite thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still, my new partner is relatively new to exploring his kinks. So that's been fun going, well, what are you into? And he's into some, some shit I've never heard about. So we were like, okay, let's try that. Sure. Let's go for it. This, this is some new stuff. Um, I love exploring kink. I love finding out you know, new things that I didn't think I was into. And then oh, maybe I am uh, like, I mean, beyond it's not kink, but I also recently discovered apparently I'm bisexual and never realized that until like a month ago because my partner is gender fluid and showed up one day as a woman. And I was like, Oh, and then I started piecing things together and going, wait a minute. Uh, I'm also attracted to other women you know, and it started, it just sort of sent me down this thing. And so all these, this discovery of self is continuing to happen. And kink is a big part of that. 
you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And thanks for sharing that example too, because it's important that like, you know, however many years ago that you started down this road and that like, it's, you're still, it's a continual process. You're still exploring new things. You're still, go ahead. You're about to talk. (laughs) No, I was waiting for you to finish, but I was just like, I was just thinking of like where you're at today, that realization that, that you may be or that you are bisexual, like the way you handled that today versus like, if you had come to that 10 years ago, like, I feel like you're just like, Oh, well, this is a thing I, I am now. Like, would it have been that same reaction 10 years ago? I mean, I'm, I don't know. I didn't know. Probably not. Because I, I mean, I was in denial. And I mean, I realized sure. I've always been bisexual, but always it's like, I'm not really interested in women. I'm just acknowledging that a girl's cute. You know, I'm staring right. at her tits, but uh, that's just because she has really nice tits. You know, it's not like, <laughs> ugh. Um, yeah. And the fantasies that I would have would always be in my head were always threesomes and there was always a man there. And then one day I was like, what, what if I just take the man away? What happens? And I was like, Oh no, I'm still cool with that. Okay. Okay. You know, I think 10 years ago, I wouldn't have allowed myself to think that because that's not normal. That's not what you're supposed to be. And I was like, I was this normal person who was into normal things. And, um, you know, it's not, not true. Well, I mean, what is normal? That's, that's a whole research project I've got going on right now is how we decided what normal is. I've been reading like a million books about it. Uh, and I still don't have a conclusion exactly. There's, there's a lot of sources for why, but anyway. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing we didn't name our podcast after that. <laughs> <laughs> that really muddy the waters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we touched a little bit on kink and it's something that we don't, I mean, we've touched on in our, our interviews, but not all the time. And so y- you've talked a little bit about your relationship with Gabriel and how there was a dom sub dynamic there. And I was curious if you'd be able to talk a little bit about what that looked like, like on a day to day basis, because people who may not be familiar may just be curious. Like how did, how did that relationship work for you too? Um, most of our kink was in the bedroom, but there were some dynamics outside the bedroom. I was collared and, uh, like I have to do good mornings and good nights, which I've kept now my new partner and I do good mornings and good nights. Cause I like that so much. I have to make my bed every day. I have to, if I see him, I have to wear a skirt unless I've gotten permission ahead of time. I have to wear makeup. I have to do my hair, pull my hair up. I have to put my hair up, which I really hated because some days the curls look so good. Uh, but oh, I didn't hate it. it depended on the day, but, um, it, there were, you know, just little protocols. It was never any huge things. We weren't 24 seven. It was just certain things throughout the day that were touchstones that I had to do. Um, for a while I had to do 10,000 steps a day or some kind of big exercise. And I had to check in and confirm that I'd done it, um, until I got it injured, uh, little stuff like that. I'm just trying to think if there were any other rule, rules for me. I, um, they would come and go. Sometimes he would give me just assignments out of the blue, be like, hey, you need a chore to do today. There were more in the beginning, I think. And as time went by, I liked them less and less because, again, I was starting to develop my own sense of wanting more control over my life. And but that, it was it was like that. It wasn't it wasn't too it didn't interfere with my life, um, really. It was just sort of helpful stuff that I would do during the day. And, yeah. and um, if I didn't do it, I got punished. But his punishments were usually like writing essays, which don't tell him, but I like writing essays. So I'd be like, oh, you want me to research something and write an essay about it? Oh no. So, yeah. but I still don't like being punished because I really like positive reinforcement, right? I hate negative reinforcement so much. So, um, I mean, if anyone tried to do negative reinforcement with me, I would just like shut down and be like, nope, if you're going to get yelled at me anyway, then I'm just not going to do it. So I still don't like getting punished, but at the same time, the punishment was sometimes like, all right, read some stuff. Yeah. Except yeah. There, there was one day where the punishment was too much because part of the punishment and he and I disagree on this. Part of his punishment is that he doesn't talk to me until I'm finished. And, and there was a day where he gave me this just enormous punishment. I had to do way, way too much work. And at the same time I was having a fight with my roommate and I couldn't, and he was, you know, he's my primary, he's my only relationship at the time. And I couldn't talk to him about it because I was doing this punishment and this punishment took forever to do. And so I was really upset with him. And then he realized afterwards we had a discussion and he was like, okay, all of his previous relationships with, with secondary partners, they were all married. I'm the only, I'm the first time he'd been in a relationship where he was my main source of, of contact. And he realized that, okay, I can't treat, he couldn't treat me like he treated his other subs that he had to ease up on me a little bit in that respect, because I was, I was really upset 
at the fact that I couldn't talk to him because I couldn't get this punishment done fast enough. And I was having all these difficulties. So, uh, I don't even remember what you asked me and how I got there, but a little to you know, describe, like describe the kink dynamic between you two. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, as you were talking, I think that for somebody who has just not, is not familiar with this type of relationship, it could come across of like, well, what that just sounds like a controlling relationship. Right. And like for it's, but you also gave the example of like, Hey, I, I didn't feel good about this and I brought it to him and we talked about it. And like, they we realized that. So yep. how do you, in that dynamic, how do you ensure, I guess, that you're still, you still have a voice and you still have that, um, autonomy in your relationship? Constant negotiation. I mean, you get to know each other, you know, in any relationship, you get to know each other, you get to know your, the faces you make when you're unhappy and the, how to communicate. But, um, you know, in the, in the beginning of every scene, one of the things that he would always say, I mean, this is just scene specific, but one of the things that he would always say is, what do you need? First question, what do you need? And I would say, uh, impact play, or I just want to be held or, you know, whatever. And he would always do his best to accommodate that. So it wasn't always about his needs. And, you know, when we got together, one of our first conversations were about what kind of things we're into. Constant negotiation. There are things that I wasn't really interested in in the beginning, but was like, okay, later on, I would tell him like, okay, I'm okay with this. If you want to do this now, I'm I'm accepting of it. So it was always a negotiation. And, and I mean, it, to me, it was always very consensual. And he was getting needs met and I was getting needs met. I, I very much liked liked that there was somebody telling me what to do. And now not so much outside the bedroom, but I still really in the bedroom, I still very much like being told what to do. Um, I'm exploring switching with my new partner and I'm not very good at it, but I'm trying really hard. So it was, it was, it was always consensual. It was never something I didn't want. And it was never something he didn't want that if you don't want to do it, then you just say no, that's okay. I mean, he would joke, he would say things like, you're not allowed to say no to me, you know, but that was never, he always knew I knew that wasn't true. It was just part of the role play. And a lot of kink is role play. It's, it's all role play, really. It's just you pretending that you, the Dom pretends that they have control over you and you pretend they have control over you. But at any point you can revoke it. You know, if you're in a positive relationship, that's. So that, that's the way it should be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. the way it should be. Yeah. Which yeah. I yeah. preach the high heavens and go on rants on that all day long. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's huge. And so thank you for sharing that. How, how do you, and now that you're out, in, I don't know, maybe you were, you were always out in the world exploring and looking for that. How do you vet for that and ensure that you're not falling into that, like with somebody who is truly trying to control you and you don't have that autonomy? Ever since my divorce, I have a red flag meter that is just constantly going off. I don't trust anyone, which is good and bad. Um, I, like I said, I, I, I get kind of skis out a little easily. That's why I don't go to munches. My first one was a kind of a negative experience. And I was just like, nope, not going back. Um, I, uh, I'm just, in fact, it's, it's sometimes can be a problem because I'm like, oh, we had a disagreement, run, run away. And then I have to be like, no, it's people have disagreements. It's okay. Um, so for me, anytime someone like, but I think the biggest red flags are anyone who doesn't agree with safe words, get out. Like if you're not a fan of safe words, then if you don't believe in them, you're fake, go. Um, Anyone who doesn't consider the subs, any dom who doesn't consider the sub needs or any, you know, it also goes the other way. I would say probably not as frequently, but there are subs who also will abuse their doms. But in my case, since I'm mostly a sub, uh, it's usually just like, yeah, if you, if you don't agree that I'm allowed to revoke control, if you, if you say that if I want to be your sub, I have to do these things, that's not okay. Cause it's also about my needs. It's not just about what you want. It's also about my needs. And that's always the case. It should always be about the sub needs just as much as the Dom needs. And if you're like, if your Dom doesn't believe in aftercare, if, if you don't want aftercare, if that's how you like it, that's fine. But if they just say like, Oh, you don't need aftercare. You're fine. You know, if you don't feel like you have sub drop and you can sub drop is, uh, for those who don't know, sub drop is when sometimes you have a really intense scene and you get all these hormones and you get all this, uh, adrenaline built up in you. And then the next day or a couple of days later, even a few hours later, you feel an incredible sense of insecurity and just general sort of depressive feelings. And, uh, in that moment, the person you should be able to talk to is your top, is your dom. And if they're not willing to do that for you, if they're not willing to talk you down and tell you how good you were or vice versa, cause doms experience dom drop too. You should be able to talk to yourself about it. 
Um, that's also kind of a red flag. And just basically not being there for each other is, is anyone who's not willing to, to, to do the work because it is work. It's work to be a dom. It's also work to be a sub and you have to be willing to do it. And if you're not, if you think it's just all about your needs and not anything else, then get out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you said, a constant ne- negotiation and, uh, that's, I mean, that's a big part of all relationships and adding this kink dynamic into a relationship is just another layer of all of that. Um, thank you for sharing all of that and clarifying too. Um, thank you for asking. Yeah. I'm also curious how you said you're pretty open, how open in your life, I guess, about non-monogamy and kink are you? It says, you know, you talk a lot to different people, but I'm just curious how that has gone with family and friends. I don't have family. That's, that's one of the, you know, it's kind of in the beginning. It was really sad to not have family, but it's like, oh, I don't, I don't have family. I don't care. I live, I work in a really liberal industry where nobody cares. My family does not care. My, I have a sister. She's great. She's, she doesn't understand it, but she is not judgmental about it either. And, uh, I don't give her too many details because I think she's quietly like clutching her pearls, but she's never been judgmental. She's never said anything negative. Other than that, yeah, I don't talk to family members. Um, I have some cousins that I'm, Facebook friends with, they're pretty cool and they don't care either. Other than that, I guess I just don't have relationships with people who would care, who would care in a negative way. I just don't do it. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's kind of nice. No, I don't, I, I, and I have that luxury, which is one of the reasons I talk about it a lot because I want to normalize it. Let's normalize it. Um, (laughs) I don't have to worry about getting fired. I don't have to worry about getting excommunicated from my family. So I talk about it in the openly to everyone, all my friends know in the hopes that the more people like me who can talk about it do, that will bring us around gradually as a society to to all being able to talk about it. And then people don't have to feel shame anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, how about moving forward? Do you see yourself continuing down the non-monogamous path? It sounds like yes, but I'm just asking the question to see kind of what what you see your fu- in your future. After Gabriel and I broke up, I thought about that a lot. I was like, I don't know. Do I really want, now that we're not together, do I want to be non-monogamous? Am I really non-monogamous? And I, it's sort of like, I don't necessarily feel the need to have a lot of relation. I think I'm more non-monogamous than polyamorous. I think I don't really care if I have multiple relationships, but I do still want to date. I do still want to have, you know, I want to have threesomes. I want to have dungeon. I want to go to dungeon parties. I want to do, you know, I want to see what it's like to have sex with a girl. Because the only time I've ever done that, it was a threesome and, and not much happened. Um, I, you know, I, I want to do all these things. And and it's so for me, it's if it develops into a relationship somewhere along the line, eh, okay. But I'm not pushing for that again because my schedule is so weird. It was hard. It was actually my two months of having two boyfriends was really hard because <laughs> I don't have that many days open, you know. <laughs> Um, I do too many things. And I was like, crap, it's, it's, it's twice as hard to have two boyfriends as it is to have one boyfriend. Shit. Is it okay to say shit? I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, it's totally okay. fine. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a family friendly, non monogamy podcast. Um, yeah, this one's for everyone under the age of 10. <laughs> <laughs> so they can learn about it early and really grow into yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've said though that you don't like munches, you don't like fat life. I think those are like the, when somebody starts to Google, like, how do I get into kink or how do I get into BDSM? Like those are probably going to be some of the first resources that mm-hmm. show up. If you don't necessarily like those, what you, you mentioned Facebook groups, like what other resources have you found to be useful to meet people? Oh, I was going to say, well, I have a TV series that I'm trying to make for that exact reason. Exactly. Um, well, that, that, that's part of it for sure. And, and uh, we will get back to that. I yeah. promise. Um, <laughs> But like for people who are like, well, yeah, Facebook sounds great. Like there's all these Facebook communities, but like I'm not as out as yeah. Emily. I don't want everybody knowing that I'm into whatever thing I'm into. I think FetLife is a good resource when you're starting out because you can just about anything you're into, there's a group for that on FetLife and you can go in anonymously. And and so that was a really good resource for me starting out. It was just the environment I didn't necessarily love. Some some places on Fat Life are great, but then you do you do have to constantly swat away grossness. But uh, Fat Life is actually I would still say Fat Life is a very good resource. I mean, we have a profile on Fat Life. I'm not saying Fat Life is a bad place. It's just select mm-hmm. people on Fat Life kind of can ruin it. 
there are really, really great, re- like what's the safe word is probably my personal favorite kinkster. Um, they have a YouTube series and a podcast and they are amazing. They're very, they're, they're very queer focused. Um, and, but, but it's good for anybody. They, they even do like rope tutorials, but most of their stuff is about queer content and are, uh, sorry, uh, kink content and, um, uh, pup amp. Who's the, who's there's two hosts, but it's, it's really pup amps baby. He, he just went full time on it. So that is one of my favorite, uh, just, I always learn something, um, from them. There's some, uh, there's other podcasts I've listened to sort of scattering, uh, here and there about kink, but you know, kinky F's pretty good. Um, but I think, uh, by and large, most of, most of my resources have just been, just a, there's no, it's not like when you're polyamorous, you read the ethical slut. That's the first book in any group. Someone will point you to that book. That's the one. There isn't really a resource like that in the king community. So you just sort of have to cobble it together from different places. Um, you know, one of the most useful ones used to be on Tumblr there. I wish I could remember the name of it. There was a Tumblr page that I got all kinds of really cool information from. That was probably one of the best resources on the internet. And of course, Tumblr took away anything that was fun. So <laughs> that's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's that's sort of how I learned, and and a lot by doing and just thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. and meeting people, like just talking to other people as you, yeah, yeah, Come across yeah. them. So we also know that you, as we said earlier in this episode, that you are uh, starting this series called Welcome to Kinkyville, and we'd love to hear more about, I guess, the motivations behind it and what it's going to look like, and anything else you'd like to share. Um, I'm really heckin' excited, guys. Um, <laughs> So I was a few years ago, I was working on a screenplay about, um, a V a polyamorous V and, um, it was not working. The script just wasn't working. And I was like, okay, what if I take, um, two of the, two of the three people in this V are, are, are a kinky couple. I was basically basing it off my own relationship of Gabriel and Sonia and me. And, um, but it was going to be, uh, an action movie about a kidnapping. But it wasn't, it wasn't working. And I thought, what if these two people decide to start, what if there's like a frame story and these two people start a little show together called How to Be Kinky? And I, I was, I still remember I was driving down the street and I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. I should do that. So I started writing that in. The more I started working on the little frame of How to Be Kinky and what this show was, it was just going to be like a little YouTube show, you know, two people in front of a camera just talking about kink. The more I started working on what that was, what the frame story was, the less interested I became in the screenplay. And I think that's the reason the screenplay wasn't working is because it was not an idea that was going to work. Um, but I, I sort of became obsessed with this idea, this little show. And I, I, as I said before, I will constantly give people lectures, hopefully lectures they enjoy about, um, uh, safe kink and, and how, cause the, I noticed not always, not all subs are women, but the larger number are. And, and it's very, one of the things I started to see happen over and over again was women who were new subs coming on to these groups and saying, well, my Dom says that I have to let him slap me in the face. And I don't really like being slapped in the face, but he says that I'm a sub. So I have to do it. And I'd be like, girl, and just on the keyboard. And I did this. I felt like I was giving the same speech over and over again. It happens a lot. And, uh, it sort of motivated me to, to write all that into this fake show I was creating. And as I was creating the fake show, I was like, well, maybe, maybe I should make it an actual show and just hire a couple of actors to, to do some skits in front of a, a rig light. And then I met with a producer friend of mine and she said, no, you, you, you shouldn't do that. You have a thing. You should do more with it. And I, you know, and she gave me some really, really good suggestions. And one of them was that I should be in front of the camera. And, um, but I know my, my education is cobbled together. I've also haven't been doing this for a whole lot of time. So I wanted to bring on board a sex educator to help me with it. And I, so I called, uh, so I, I found Javeda Bay. She's fantastic. I believe you guys are talking to her as well. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, she's perfect. I wanted someone at the time I thought I was straight. So I wanted someone who was not straight, someone who was not white, someone who was, uh, um, not educated, someone who was a switch, all the things that I wasn't so that they could balance out and someone who had a great personality. And she was perfect. She fits the bill. She's also been just like the best partner in this. She's been game for everything, positive energy. I love her to death. And, and so I wrote the show around that because I work in live action and that was the plan was to make just this live action show. And then the pandemic happened. And I was like, I've never worked in animation. I was like, okay, well, we can't do live action anymore. Let's make it animated. And anyone who has worked in animation listening to that right now is probably laughing their ass off because, <laughs> um, 
that was like a year and a half ago. Um, <laughs> and now it's like, oh, we're finally ready to launch our Kickstarter. That's how long animation takes. It's just as expensive as live action. Um, but I'm actually really glad we ended up going with animation because I feel like it allows us... One of the things I was struggling with was how to portray sex scenes on this show because my whole objective is because there is no ethical slut for kink. That's what I want it to be. I want it to, I want it to be the show that people come to if you're new and you're exploring, let's say you've just read or seen 50 shades and you're like, Ooh, and you don't know what to do. You're like, I want to get into this, but there's no easy place to find this information if you're a beginner. And so, you know, I think advanced kinksters can also learn something because we're going to go explore all kinds of stuff. Like I can't wait to talk about furries. I don't understand the furry thing. So I'm really stoked about researching it uh, and feet. I'm actually feet repulsed. So I can't wait to explore like a, a, a foot fetish and just like get to the bottom of what all that is, all those things. But, uh, but primarily our first goal is as a welcome to new, that's why it's called welcome to Kinkyville, sort of a welcome to new kinksters. Okay. Here's a safe way to get started. Here's some stuff you may not know about. And that's going to be our objective. But with animation, I don't have to worry about our sex scenes being as, because the whole point is to be non-threatening. And I was worried about the sex being too, scenes being too scary, but if they're animated, then they're a little more friendly. Um, they're a little bit less intimidating. It's a little bit easy and it's easier to get away with sex scenes when the, the, the genitals aren't real and, and you're not making actors uncomfortable either. So, uh, the more, and it's, it's just makes it a little bit more friendly. So that was where we ended up with, we're basically in Adam ruins everything for kink, you know, all the, the, the basics that you need. And the premise is that Jave and I, there's a couple at the beginning of every episode or, or triad, we don't know, whatever happens or person, um, that is trying to explore a new kink and, they're making some some maybe not so great choices. And then Jave and I show up out of nowhere because, you know, who doesn't love two random people showing up in your bedroom? Um, and we go, what are you doing? Come here. And then we go to this magical place called Kinkyville where there is no, we, our tagline is leave your shame at the door. You go into Kinkyville. There's no shame here. As long as you're consenting human adults, you, can, you know, nothing is wrong. And, um, and, and we have these little areas in the place for different kinks. And so as we go through the show, we're going to just like teach people, you know, how to be a little bit, um, uh, make better choices. And then at the end of the episode, they go back to practice what they've learned and have a really successful session and everybody wins. And that's the objective of the show. Wow. <laughs> I'm so excited. I am too. And I think, you. you know, we, we've seen the trailer by now because this episode's coming out a little bit later. A lot of people have seen the trailer. We got to s- sneak peek it. It was awesome. Like was. we're super excited about it. It's it's and get reels a trailer editor and he he just nailed it. I was just gonna have us talk into a camera and show some like stills and he was like, No, we gotta do more. Yeah. And uh I I would agree he was right on this one because it came out awesome and like it hooked us. Yeah. That's why you're here. So yeah, I I encourage people to go check out the trailer and the and the Kickstarter uh campaign and everything because this is the type of work that like needs to be out there. So mm-hmm. thank you for doing it. Um, yeah. Thanks to Gabriel for being a part of it. And Jave, we're excited to talk to, to her as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to ask too, like, so if people want to support you uh, and your work and they want to learn more, what I know the Kickstarter is out now as this mm-hmm. is airing, but links in the show notes, links are in the show notes. It, what can they, what's the best things? What are the best things they can do to support you? Um, well, you can go to welcome to kinkyville.com. Um, we are also at Kinkyville TV on all the socials. Please share it with all your rich friends and, you know, any friends who are not rich, if they want to contribute to, um, give us money. Uh, you get stuff in return because it's a Kickstarter. That's how they work. And I think we got some pretty cool rewards. Uh, yeah, give us, give us money and get stuff out or share us and like us and you tell all your friends and talk about us and especially your kinky friends post in your groups. Yeah. Yeah. And where like ultimate goal is like on cable TV or like Netflix or something along those lines? My, f- yeah, all the streamers, um, I think our best bet is probably Amazon Prime or HBO Max. Um, mm-hmm. but we're also, we'd also love to take a shot at Netflix. Hulu's probably a long shot, but you never know. Hulu might be okay too. Yeah, we'll see. And we can get all those because I'm, I'm in the film industry. Gabriel's in the film industry. We both know a lot of people. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, we're not worried about getting the meetings, but the, the, the point of making the pilot episode, which is what we're doing is, uh, so we're not making the whole series. We're just gonna make the pilot and then we're going to pitch it. Um, it's called a pitch pilot. And the whole point of that is I, 
I'm nobody. I am a script supervisor who writes screenplays but doesn't have a name anyone knows. And no one involved with our project has a name anyone knows. And when that happens, it's kind of impossible to get something like this made. So the idea was if we have something to show them, what it's going to look like, that we can pull it off, that it's a really good idea, then they will, the networks will be more interested in buying it. So if we have, that's the other thing. If you like our campaign, if you contribute to it, if we have large numbers of people contributing to the campaign, it shows that there's an audience out there for this. So even if you contribute like $10, just having extra people, the more people we have and the more people, when we, when we launch, when we post the episode, the more people like us on YouTube, you know, if we can get those numbers up, then it shows the networks that this is content that people want to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. No, I think, I think, you know, to build on that though, is to say to people that like the goal here isn't just like you're helping build a YouTube channel. Like this could, your contributions will help take this to like a mainstream media and yeah, really exactly. push, really push this into like the homes and ears and eyes of like lots of people. Yeah. And I think that's just something that we're really excited about. Yeah. And it all goes back to that normalizing piece yeah. of like, get this information out there. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is like on a Facebook page, when someone makes a joke out of anal sex or when someone makes a joke out of wearing women's lingerie and I will very, very straight faced go in and explain tips on how to do anal sex, right. Or talk about where to find, you know, uh, women's lingerie that will fit on a man's body. And, and the reaction I get is always just like, uh, uh, oh, oh no, I was joking. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm not. <laughs> um, and I think like where, cause just yesterday someone joked about wearing women's shoes as if it was like, this, he, he isn't that ridiculous. And, uh, and I, I, I mean, people are allowed to joke. You're, you know, I have a sense of humor, kind of. <laughs> um, but I also think that we've, we've, we've made people's kinks a punchline and we don't really, re and, it, and it, and it contributes to this, this shame. Like if someone was hearing you make that joke and they like wearing women's underwear, then they're going to feel like you're not a safe person they can talk to about it. And I just, you know, I want, I want it to become to a point where you can make that joke, but make that joke in good fun and not as if you were trying to shame anyone who's into it. Yeah. You know, the, the more we talk about it, the more we admit to the things we're into and, 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 Say what you will about Fifty Shades, and obviously there's problems with it, but uh, it did get people to start talking about it and not feel like it was a bad thing anymore. Like, it's totally okay to be into, you know, if you want to get spanked. Well, I guess that's a bad example because that movie kind of shames spanking. But, um, but it, 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 you know, it, it did open up the conversation to the mainstream a little bit more, and that's what I hope to do, but maybe from a, a place with a little bit more knowledge, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's amazing. And... Again, we're excited about it and hopefully, yeah, people listening will contribute. And, you know, I, I always have this fantasy that like, you know, you hear about different celebrities who are maybe into non-monogamy. I always dream that like the Dak Shepherds and Will Smiths and Jada's are listening. So all of you oh, really, yes, please. all of you huge <laughs> celebrity slash producers out there who are listening, like reach out, help make this happen. Um, and come on the show. Yeah, right. Come, uh, but, come talk to us. That'd be awesome. <laughs> but also help make help make this project a reality because we're super excited about it. And yeah, just again, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm legitimately excited about it. So. No, I am too. It's amazing. Yeah. And um, thank it's you been three years working on this for me, and it's finally like we're we're well. By the time this airs, we will have launched, and I'm just like, if this was my career from now on, I would be so happy, just running around doing panels, talking to people about sex all the time, you know, making people feel safe. That's that's the goal. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, and I, we wanted to give you the opportunity to share anything else you wanted to share with us, talk about anything else you wanted to talk about. Again, everything you've talked about for to all the links, everything is going to be in the show notes. So listeners, uh, scroll down in your podcast player, click those links to the show notes. But yeah, uh, anything else, Emily, that we haven't covered that you wanted to cover and get out there in the world today? I love Dungeons and Dragons. That's it. That's <laughs> all I got. A big, a big D and D fan. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, that's the only thing left. That's the only thing left. <laughs> that's we perfect. covered everything else uh, related. Well, you will make some friends from for, from that comment, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we know that for sure. We know that my, for sure. My Twitter, I'm on Twitter a lot. 
So my Twitter handle is at the Emily Blake because, you know, pretentious. <laughs> Feel free to follow me. Right now, my DMs are open as of this recording. Once we launch the show, uh, we'll see how long it takes before I have to close them. But for now, they're open. You can DM me all you like. And and that's been really cool, too, is because I've talked on Twitter about kink. I have sometimes said, hey, if you have a question, feel free to DM me. And I've gotten almost always men DMing me saying, hey, is this okay, this thing I'm thinking about? And I'm like, yes, let's talk about it. And then I point them to resources. And it's just, it's anytime I say that, I get people who have been hiding it and don't know where to turn. And I'm just, yes, bring me, bring me these questions. I will answer them for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was just going to say too, one of the things that I love about the way you put this together is, um, like you said, you wanted to, you have your experience, you know, in kink and your lived experiences, but like you went and got Jave, who's a sex educator, who's trained in this. And I think Gabe, Gabe mentioned too, that like one of your requirements, maybe don't quote me on this was no, like cis white hetero men. Yes. So like, I want to say as one of those people that I'm not offended in the least, I am extra excited about this because I get to play a role anyways. Yes, yeah. you do. Um, oh, yeah. And, and I mean, we, I, we had, we've had, uh, like the guy who da- designed our logo is a white guy. He is gay. Um, <laughs> but the, the I just, I just sort of feel like the industry is so dominated by that, that I wanted to make sure this was all the voices. I mean, and, and it's always in the back of my mind, people with disability. I try to keep a list of like, you know, all the, the racial makeup, the, the, um, sexual, um, what do you call them? Like, um, not preferences. That's not the word. Uh, Ident- identities. Ident- yes. Thank you. <laughs> Duh. Ident- all identities, all, you know, trans are welcome. Just everything. I want to try to incorporate all of that into, into episodes as we go along and to make sure. And I wanted to make sure there were people there to remind me of that, to not let me get too into my, you know, my white cishet world. Although now I'm not head anymore, I guess. Um, you know, so that that is very important to me and i yeah and i wh- is this how white guys you're absolutely welcome i love you i just you know i've dated many of you i just didn't want this to be i just wanted this to be a really inclusive thing so that my voice is not the only one there mm-hmm. yep yeah and i think that's huge like yeah. to to make a resource that represents everybody it's so powerful to have everybody working on it mm-hmm. and yeah, there's no short of heteronormativity injected into our lives that, like, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be completely lost um, just yeah. because there's no white cis het guys running yeah. around the, and, the production. And, and the couple in our first, in our pilot episode is a, a, a cis het couple. I don't know. Uh, I think the, if I if I keep to the actors I intended on casting, then the woman is white and the man is Asian. Um, so we do, oh, wow, I guess we still don't have any cis het white dudes. I didn't even do that on I mean, I did that on purpose, but I didn't like exclude. <laughs> it's a whole thing. Anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I was thinking, I think it's great. So I yeah, think it's great I'm too, excited yeah. again um, for all. And just, I wanted to say thank you again for the work that you're doing for coming on the show, sharing your story. Hopefully we get to bring you back on when you're on Hulu and Netflix and <laughs> Amazon and HBO. All, all the things. All of them. I'll be super famous and I'll be able to plug your podcast. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We want. That's one of the. Oh, good. Sorry. No, I was going to say we want to be like at the top of the rolling credits as they roll through. <laughs> yeah. What, what were yeah, you going to say? I was going to say. Oh, one of the things that I'm glad we switched to uh, animation is not that I expect to be super famous, but if we do get the show like super huge, I can still walk down the street and not be recognized by most people, which is kind of yeah. nice. But yeah. I'm anticipating, look at my ego is already up here. I'm already anticipating massive success, Emmy Awards. I'm already practicing my speech, picking out what I'm going to wear. Um, I'm already, I'm already there, which is why I'm really setting myself up for, for, uh, for possible massive disappointment when I don't well, it's get been an three, Emmy. It's been three years in the making. So you yeah. have to set your, like the bar really high, right? Like yeah. <laughs> for yourself. Well, yeah. if you don't get an Emmy, I have an Emma you can borrow. Oh, that's cute. Oh, <laughs> I just that thought of that right now. That was adorable. That was a little cheesy, but. <laughs> well, wow. I'm happy I got to say that before we let you go. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we will let you go. Have a wonderful evening. We know you got to get back to work and we're just excited. So thank you again, Emily, for coming on. And thank you guys. This was really fun. Thank you so much. And thanks for all that you do and your efforts to normalize it. 
Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank okay. you. And we're back. Thank you so much, Emily, for coming on the show and sharing your story and for all the amazing work you're doing with Welcome to Kinkyville. We're so excited, as we said at the beginning, to end during the interview, to get this information out there and spread the word and hopefully, hopefully get your TV series up and running. Yeah. And so, again, if you're listening to this, definitely check it out. Think about sending a couple of bucks their way. Honestly, even just a few dollars is enough to help because one of the things that's important is how many people are backing this that shows that there's interest in it. So even if it's just a couple of bucks or if you can't support it financially, go ahead and just share it on all of your social media and your TikTok if you got one of those. We it's don't, also social media. I know. I know, but I thought I like the word TikTok. Okay. <laughs> we don't have a TikTok. The, the point is to share it widely. Yes. Um, I don't think we have, we, we talked a lot during the intro. My voice is a little raspy. We're going to keep this outro short. And next week we have an interview with Jave, who is a sex educator and is actually co-hosting Welcome to Kinkyville with Emily. So her story is amazing. You're going to want to come back and listen again. Yeah, make sure you pee first because you're going <laughs> to laugh a lot. And you don't, you don't want to pee in your car. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> true, true. Just come back. A, a disclaimer. And listen to that one and t- take, Finn, take Finn's advice before listening. Always take my advice. <laughs> Emma has learned that over the years. Oh, boy. We're going down a rabbit hole here. I don't think we need to go there. <laughs> so... Other advice I have, head over to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on any one of the tabs and you will find all of the information you could ever want. Hey, including some of our favorite resources, including ways to get tested for STIs, discounts on condoms, custom fit condoms, Mm -hmm. ways to meet people, ways to find Emma and me in person. So many things. All of the things. Well, that sounded exciting. (laughs) I am trying to say there's a lot of information on our website. And so go check it out and reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you as we said that before. And with that, I think we will see everybody next week. Yep. Sounds good. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.